My name is Nancy Zeller and I'm the coordinator of the Science Teaching Labs and uh, it is my honor to introduce uh, the Dean of College Arts and Sciences, uh, Peter Starr. Let me just start by saying how amazing it is that we have well over a hundred people here on a rainy Friday afternoon where there are two holidays that are competing with uh, what we're, we're doing here. It's a remarkable turnout and I think it shows just the depth of commitment of this university, of this faculty and this student body to, the, it, to women's success and achievements in science. Um, I, mentioned to, I mentioned to some folks over lunch, and most of you know this, but I, wanna, I just want to say, I want to do a shout out to our provost, Scott Bass, who has been very instrumental in the, in the uh, uh, foregrounding of science at American University foregrounding women in science at American University, and the fact that we have two science buildings now in the preparation, one coming out of the ground on the East Campus site, and another one that is in planning phases on the Beagley site. And as I said to the group over lunch, by, by 2019, all the science faculty and students are going to be working in new labs and new buildings. That's an extraordinary turnaround. <laughs> At the risk of, of, of being an ungracious guest in a, a, a School of International Service building, I would like to just do a quick shout out to the back of that t-shirt that's going around that if you don't have one yet, we will make more of them that says, AU, come for the politics, stay for the science. <laughs> it's a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Joe Handelsman. Um, who is Associate Director for Science in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or if you work in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, you would call it OSTP. This makes her, of course, one of President Obama's top advisors on science and its implications for policy. Dr. Handelsman came to Washington uh, thanks to a leave from Yale. They want her back, I am certain, where she is the Frederick Phineas Rose Professor of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology. She received her PhD in molecular biology, together, I guess, with uh, uh, Heidi Sophia, uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and served on the faculty there from 1985 to 2009 before moving to Yale. Dr. Handelman's, Handelman's research focused on the diversity of microorganisms in soil, plant, and insect gut communities, and she is one of the pioneers in the field of functional metagenomics. Indeed, I'm told she, is, she coined the term metagenomics. I'm a literature professor, so these, your, you, your scientist's ability to put words together just flabbergasts me. <laughs> the first time I heard of biogeochemistry, I thought, I've got to create biogeo-English. <laughs> Beyond her metagenomic work, Dr. Handelsman is internationally known, that's why you're here today, for her efforts to improve science education and to increase the participation of science, uh, women and majorities in science, both in universities and beyond. She's a relentless advocate for the use of scientific evidence to guide improvements in STEM education and for broadening the, the pool of scientists pursuing uh, uh, careers in the STEM fields. In 2011, she was one of 11 individuals selected by President Obama to receive the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Mentoring. The next year, Nature named her, quote, one of the 10 people who mattered, unquote, for her research on gender bias in science. But what landed Joe Handelsman in the national headlines a few years back was a study on gender bias that she led at Yale. I won't say any more about the study because it's the subject of her work today. Although it's important to recognize gender bias wherever we find it, and we at American University, I think, are on the cutting edge of trying to, 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 to foster that recognition. It is especially critical to recognize it in science if our, na if our nation is to remain a leader in the scientific disciplines. Anyone who studies performance of groups knows that gender diversity in groups is an indicator of strong performance of that group. So as our women in science group both recognizes and practices, we, we must have more women and minorities in science and in positions of scientific leadership. And with that, one of the great leaders in science today, Dr. Joe Handelsman. Well, thank you, Dean Starr, for that very gracious introduction, and uh, thank you all for uh, being here. Um, provost, I'm really amazed a provost being at a talk. That's so exciting. <laughs> I hope that's a habit of yours, because I've never known a provost that got to go to 
talks Where's on that? science. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I had a wonderful um, morning and lunch uh, on your campus, and I really thank all of you for the invitation to be here because I've just learned so much. It's an incredible place to do science. You obviously have amazing faculty and a, a really great opportunity to teach in small classes. And your students are the truly amazing part. I've been stunned by just about everybody I've met today. Um, you have a very impressive group of particularly uh, the ones that I met were young women and the representation of women in your science departments is very unusual. So for those of you who haven't been at other universities, don't take it for granted. This is an exceptional place and your women in science group um, is really quite exceptional and I visit a lot of women in science groups so I, I, I feel like I'm a little bit of an expert on that. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is quite a, a special group and, um, <clears throat> and your numbers in uh, fields like physics and math uh, are really quite, quite amazing. So now we know where to go when we want women in science, uh, we just <laughs> come to American University. So I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to talk today about one of my favorite topics and that's fairness and equity uh, and <clears throat> broadening the participation of different types of people in science. And one of the first questions that a lot of us who work in this kind of field uh, are asked is, why should we have to do anything special or think about women in science or minorities in science in any special way? Aren't we just selecting for the best? And that really gets to the basis of how most scientists believe the scientific enterprise works. And if you do a poll, you'll find out this is how most of them believe we work, and that's by a meritocracy. That if you're better, you get ahead. If your idea is better, it is accepted. If your paper is good, it will be accepted in a journal. If your uh, ideas are good, they'll be funded by grants. And this is a flawed concept. And as long as we predicate the scientific endeavor on a fundamentally flawed concept, we're not going to advance to the levels that we need to advance to. So some of the questions that come up around that are, do we want to be fair? I mean, maybe it's irrelevant, maybe we don't care. And I would say that most scientists truly believe in the, the concept of a meritocracy, even if they themselves don't practice it. They do believe it, they want to be fair. They think that quality should be what's rewarded and not other uh, random characteristics about people. And the second one is why should we be fair? And Dean Starr mentioned some of this. And I, I think it gets to the heart of how groups function. And there's a lot of evidence, a lot of research showing that diversity in groups is one of the greatest benefits. You can give groups resources, you can give them good conditions to work under, you can do all sorts of things to groups, you can train them, but one of the most powerful gifts you can give a group is themselves and making the people in the group diverse. And this has been studied uh, in many different settings and these are just a few of the studies that show uh, first that, that groups when they're trying to solve problems will come up with more effective solutions uh, and they'll also, also usually be able uh, to defend their solutions better and their solutions are more likely to be more feasible if the group that is solving the problem is more diverse. And that diversity can be measured by almost any uh, measurement. You can do it by age, you can do it by uh, race, gender. Uh, they've done really interesting work with mock trials and shown that juries that are diverse deliberate more effectively and they're much more able to defend the decisions that they make. They don't necessarily come to different decisions, but the decisions are more defended and, and rationally uh, arrived at. Uh, and then there's the concept of innovation and studies in both industry and academic settings shows that innovation uh, is, is fostered by differences among the people in groups. And there was one study that's particularly fascinating because it suggests that this is a very global principle. That study looked at uh, 100 years of uh, top level publications, some of the most high impact publications in a few fields, economics and then a number of science fields. And the teams that made those discoveries that ended up in those high impact papers. And then they also looked at the same thing, the teams that generated hit plays on Broadway. And it turned out by doing a, a very complicated uh, network and statistical analysis, they showed that the traits of the groups 
that generated either the great science or economics or Broadway plays were very similar. And one of the traits that was important in creating uh, great, creative, innovative work was a diversity. In that case, I think the strongest effect was diversity of age. They found that having novices and veterans in the same group uh, was one of the more uh, potent of effectors um, of creativity. So that's why we should all care just for our own little world that we're working in a diverse environment, whether it's our office structure or our research groups or our universities uh, or our congresses, for example. Um, we should be hoping to see those groups uh, grow more diverse and therefore better uh, at what they do. But there are also some very pressing needs in America today that will only be satisfied by diversifying the scientific community. And the first is that the brain power that goes into science has to be drawn based on the power of those brains, not on other characteristics. And there's no evidence, uh, in fact, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary, that men have a corner on the, uh, the genes involved in being good scientists. In fact, it's been shown that women and minorities have a number of traits that are not necessarily inborn, but are learned traits that are particularly useful in doing science. So we're wasting all of that intellectual talent and then a certain element of social talent that could change the way that we do science by broadening, unless that we will waste it, unless we broaden the pool of people that we draw our scientists in the, the top levels of science from. And it probably doesn't look as acute to all of you because of the gender balance in your majors here. But when you walk into many physics uh, graduate programs, for example, when I was at Yale, I, I gave a couple of talks to introductory physics uh, graduate students, first year students, they're all men. The entire class of graduate students was men. And when I asked people in the physics department, how can you have an entire department with no female graduate students? And there were a few, but they were hiding in the that day. Uh, when I asked the faculty, they, they weren't even aware of it. They, they didn't notice because that was the norm. Now, I would bet that people coming from this environment would sure notice it because it would be so much not the norm, which is great because that will mean there are people in the future, like all of you, who will be resisting uh, that norm, uh, which is not normal at all, of uh, selecting for white men in the sciences. So, so the first really pressing thing is that we need more scientists. The president has an initiative to generate a million more graduates, ba bachelor's level graduates, in STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, uh, by 2022 than we would by our, if we just kept plotting along the way we are. That's a lot more graduates. It's about a third more than we would graduate if we uh, kept going the way we are. And those estimates come from the, the growth, the economic growth in sectors of the, the, the economy that absolutely depend on science and therefore scientists or um, technologists or engineers. So that's an economic need. That's a national need. That's a patriotic need, I should say, uh, because it really is going to keep our country at the forefront uh, and competitive economically, scientifically, technologically. And we need to be there to be the vibrant country that we are. So we need more people, and we don't have enough white men to fill all those jobs. So even if we didn't care about diversity, we should be caring just about the numbers, which we need to start drawing from that larger pool of talent that's out there. And then the second thing is just the intellectual vigor. There's just no question that our science will be better if we diversify the community that does it. And finally, this is just a moral imperative, which you may or may not agree with, but I think this country has always stood for equity and a democratic system. And we're not practicing that in science today. And I think that's just not consistent with what we say we are as Americans. And so to live up to that, uh, that code and honor the tradition of this country, which is about equity, I think we need to do something about the gender and uh, race inequities. And then finally, if you don't care about any of those reasons, <laughs> it is the law. So uh, there, there are some interesting uh, changes in the way the law is going to be pursued in the next few years. And some of the things that I'm going to talk about today 
uh, unconscious and implicit or unintended biases are actually uh, looking like they may rise to the level of uh, legal action. And I think that's really a fascinating concept because there's no question that these biases have had an enormous impact at a population level. But how do you accuse any individual of practicing uh, bias in an, a legal sense um, when you can't really prove it on the individual level? You can only prove it on the population level. So <clears throat> the first question that I asked when I first got into this field was, uh, are we as diverse as we could be? And maybe we just have all the women and minorities who want to be in science. Maybe there just aren't any more. Maybe there's an intrinsic difference in interest in science in different demographic groups. And so there are a few points that I think uh, fall under that question. And also, are we taking advantage of the best minds? Not that, that we would grab the best minds who aren't interested in science, but are there the best minds out there that are wasted who really would like to be in science or could be in science if we treated them differently or if we gave them different opportunities? And the answer is no. Uh, there are, we are not treating people fairly, going back to the first question. We are judging them on characteristics other than just their merit as scientists. And as a result, we're having an effect on people's choices to become scientists in very subtle ways. And we often hear there are studies that show that women more often leave science because they say they want to have families. And that is so societally generated that you can look across different parts of society, different geographic areas. Women want to have as many babies in any part of the country, but the difference in those who believe that they can combine a family and a scientific career is quite dramatic in different schools and different uh, places and in different demographic groups. So that's something we can change. That's not something intrinsic. And by changing it, we can take advantage of uh, the quality that's out there. So I think, I hope I've convinced you or at least given you something to think about that fairness is something we should strive toward and that we would be better off, all of us, uh, that it's not just something we do for women and minorities, it's for everybody for the benefit of our entire country and the world to be fair. Um, so then the question is, uh, are we fair? And if not, how can we change? So when you talk to scientists, you hear a lot about the objectivity that they bring to their work. And they're very sure of their decisions outside of the science that they do in the laboratory or the field. And one of the quotes that I have heard so many times that I can recite it in my sleep is, we're scientists, we're objective. And that is then uh, a catchword for all sorts of other beliefs that they're, they think they're dispassionate when they evaluate their data. Well, if any of you have worked in a lab can testify they're not dispassionate when they get a result they love or they hate, you know about it. So that's not dispassionate. And that's great. It's great that scientists are passionate about their work, but then they shouldn't claim to not really care, which is what dispassionate would mean in that case. It's great that they care, but then they have to take precautions to make sure that they really are being honest and fair with their work, uh, as well as everything else. So then they also say, well, we're objective uh, when we hire people. We just hire the best people. And when you ask them, well, what's the best? At all the time I have been in this field, I have heard this phrase, and it's not going away. I know it when I see it. And I think that is one of the biggest invitations to prejudice that any phrase could possibly have. I know it when I see it. So no scientific basis, no logical characteristics that might be associated with whatever it is, and completely defensible because it's my judgment when I see it, whatever it is. And so I think that that uh, actually should be outlawed as a phrase um, <laughs> because we should not be hiring based on our gut level reactions alone. Sure, gut level reactions will always play a role in what we do, but that can't be the basis for major decisions. So when I, um, <clears throat> when I went, well, I'll tell you that story later. Um, <laughs> so first I want to show you some data that uh, indicate that we're not being fair. 
And so when scientists said to me, yeah, we're, we're objective and we just hire based on the characteristics of the applicants, I started looking at the data. And I'm trained as a biologist and so I think in terms of uh, the closest I could find was really epidemiology and public health. And if you think about the progression of studies in that field, and if you don't follow these studies, it might not be a good analogy, um, it seems that the gender research and, and also uh, racial bias research follows kind of the same pattern. In, in medicine, we first look for epidemiological correlations over big populations. But those can be misleading. They're important because they show trends at a population level, but they can also be misleading because various factors can correlate with each other and not necessarily be causal to the outcome you're looking at. So then we often will take those findings and study them in a model system, like a mouse or an Arabidopsis plant or a worm, and see whether the principles that we're seeing at a large population level in people would actually play out in controlled experiments where you can actually control the factors and determine causality. And then the hardest ones to do are the ones that then take those variables, if they show up in both the epidemiological studies and also in animal studies, um, to take them to the human level. Now, with bias experiments, it actually is, uh, is a, you're able to do that. And so that's one of the advantages of this field over a lot of medical sciences, is you can use undergraduates for your experiments in psychology. <laughs> they do it all the time. And so very often, that's how psychologists will test a prediction that they've tested for possibly in a large population study or in a laboratory uh, study with animals, then they take it to a population of undergraduates and that gets them the next level to, yes, this is a principle that goes, uh, uh, extends to humans. And then finally, you wanna take them out to the real world, not to imply that undergraduate life is not real, um, but people will never believe uh, your findings if you only have one demographic group, like undergraduates in college. So then you wanna take it out to uh, real life studies. And those are the toughest because it's hard to get those populations that are, as we say, naive uh, to what you're trying to do, uh, but, and then to be able to apply individual variables and look for the uh, impact of those <coughs> um, variables. And if you can do that, and achieve a randomized controlled trial where the vari one variable is the only thing that differs in a randomized population, then you really have powerful evidence that one thing causes another. So uh, let's look at the data that exist. So if we look first at the, the epidemiological kind of data, the population level, these are observations. And so this was a university in, I won't say where it is, probably shouldn't, um, I will keep their identity secret. Um, that a, a large university that had uh, a department of molecular biology and genetics and microbiology. And the women in the department uh, didn't know what each other's salaries were until they actually consulted with each other. And one of them, I think, became chair or something and saw the salaries of other people and said, you know, there's some inequity here. This can't be right. So they went to the dean and said, you should look at the salaries. We think there's a gender bias. And the dean looked and said, I don't see a gender bias. So they said, all right, well, could we do an experiment? Could we bring in outside raters to rate all of our faculty? And then if we plot the rating that the raters <coughs> give the faculty versus the, um, their salary, we should see that when men and women are about the same. So you can see the data, this is for men in the department, and so they had a group of outside raters rate the quality of the work, taking into account teaching and research, grants, papers, all the things that faculty do. Uh, and then they plotted the, rate, the ranking uh, that these raters gave uh, versus the salary. And it's pretty reasonable. There was a pretty high correlation between somebody's rating in this system and, and um, their salary. And that's encouraging. I mean, that would suggest that, in fact, there are some kind of common standards that we use for evaluation uh, because this outside group of raters came to the same conclusion that people in the department apparently had over years to yield results like that. But when they did it with women, of course, there aren't very many women in the department, but it looked very different. And you can see that a woman who even received a ranking of nine, and there is only even one man at that level, 
um, is making, I think as we calculated, the salary differences were close to uh, 100%. The, it's about 200,000 versus 100,000 uh, for the woman. And that's with the same ranking from this outside committee. So, and, and even if you don't accept that there's a difference for the men, you have to wonder what kind of system is being used if the women with very different rankings are being paid all the same. So even apart from the gender issue, there seems to be almost a ceiling here that women can't uh, get through. So that's just anecdotal, right? That's one department, and we could never prove um, to everyone's satisfaction that the women really are as good as uh, the men with the same rankings. And so that's, that's not perfect evidence, but it sure is a little suspicious, right? So then if you look at some of the National Science Foundation's data, they look across the whole country. So this is now a very big population. It's the opposite of looking at a single department. And they looked at uh, men and women when they graduate from college with a bachelor's degree, they found that uh, at that level, the men are making 18% more than uh, the women. So these are bachelor's level uh, graduates. So people said, yeah, but men have been in the workforce longer, so they probably make more. So then they said, okay, well, the new graduates should account for that. Well, when they looked at that, they got even a bigger difference. Men in that group, this was 29 and younger, uh, so they've been in the workforce, all of them, for a relatively short period of time, there's a 26% difference. The men are making 26% more than the women. Okay, so here again we have a correlation, but this is across an entire population in the country that makes you wonder, are the women really that much less good at their jobs that they should be paid 26% less, or is there something else going on here? Again, it's uh, circumstantial, but it's getting a little suspicious. There's a very famous study that has been attacked over and over and over over the years, and that was the Swedish postdoc study. A couple of scientists in Europe noticed that the Swedish government gave out fellowships for postdoctoral study, just like we do here from the National Institutes of Health. Their Institute of Health gave out these fellowships, and women weren't getting them. And they thought, well, that's kind of odd, because our graduate students in many of these fields are half women, half men. You would think they're coming out of the same universities with the same training, they would have equal opportunities. So they subpoenaed, because the government wouldn't give them the data willingly, they subpoenaed the data. And they did an analysis, uh, they decided that at, at the postdoctoral, pre-postdoctoral level, the biggest thing that you would have to judge is publications. So they came up with this calculation of what they call total impact, which was a combination of the number of papers and the impact factor of the journals that they were in. And a lot of people don't believe in impact factors, but again, we have an internal control here. And then they took the ratings that the different uh, postdoc applications had received by the panel that reviewed them. And with the men, once again, we see a pretty nice relationship they were right. We are judging the male candidates very, uh, you can account for most of the uh, variation in terms of the impact, uh, the total impact of their papers. So that does seem to be the dominant um, uh, element in the applications. But with women, once again, we see this flatness. And they calculated that women would have to publish something like um, three or four more papers in a journal like Science or Nature, which are the sort of top, very, very visible journals, very hard to get into uh, in science, in order to get the same ranking uh, or rating as a man, and they'd have to publish 22 more papers than a man in uh, a regular standard journal, Journal of uh, Neurobiology or something like that, in order to get the same ranking. I'm not even sure how you could predict that, uh, because we only have one point that, uh, that actually budges from this flat line. Um, but if you assume that that line between the two points is linear, then I guess you can extrapolate out. So again, we don't have uh, proof of anything here of what's causal, but we do know that with men, there is a set of, of criteria being used that somehow are different with the women. So even though with men, the number and impact of their papers is a driver of their rating, that doesn't seem to be the driver with women. 
And people for years tried to come up with all sorts of explanations for why this could be and be quite legitimate and not be gender biased. Uh, but it has an interesting similarity to um, the salary data that I showed you, where you actually can predict quite nicely what the basis for salary, and in this case, ratings for fellowships are for men, and it just doesn't work for women. So whether you believe in the basis of the rating system or not, you have to accept that we are using something different to judge women uh, in science. So these are, again, the epidemiological level. They show correlations, and people can always argue that there's something else. You know, like all the women had bad letters of recommendations. So yes, they had the same papers, but their letters of recommendation were terrible. We don't know that, but that's the kind of explanation that people have been uh, providing for years on the postdoc study. So then we go to model systems, and we ask in a clean, uh, randomized controlled trial, even though it may be very artificial, what do we find? Are we fair? Do we treat men and women the same way and evaluate them by the same criteria? And so a very classical experiment in social psychology is when you ask reviewers to rate a candidate who's applying for a job uh, or uh, is ready for promote, look, being examined for promotion. And so there are a number of variations on this, but the first one is a really interesting one where they just looked at a paragraph that the uh, supposed employee or applicant had written, and then they had the uh, raters rate the quality of the verbal skills for this um, mythical person. And they found that very consistently and statistically significantly, the raters would rate the verbal skills lower if they were told that the very same paragraph was written by either an African American or a man. Interesting. So there's some sort of assumption there that African Americans don't write as well as whites and men don't write as well as women. That was the first surprise. There's not an absolute knowing it when you see it uh, sense of quality here. It depends on who you think wrote it. The other kind, the, the rest of these hiring studies was not just rating uh, the writing, but rating a, an entire application and saying, would you hire this person or not? And so this experiment is now about 50 years old and has been done every which way you can imagine. And there are literally hundreds of papers that show this, where you present your reviewers with identical materials and all you vary is the name on the, on the materials so that they think a randomized group of reviewers, of course, they think that they're reviewing either a man or a woman or uh, people of different uh, races or ethnicities. And over and over and over, when this standardized experiment has been done, they find pretty much the same thing, that in every study of these hundreds of studies, the reviewers are more likely, and it's often a substantial advantage, uh, they're more likely to hire the person if there's a man's name on the application. And there's been some work done also with race, and the results are very similar with whites having an advantage. A lot more has been done in this field on gender, though. So it's kind of interesting that explicit bias or you know, what you see in society around you, the way people talk about women or minorities, has really changed a lot over the last 40 years. And there's evidence of that. There are studies that look at people's articulated or conscious biases, and at least what they're willing to say or what you can measure through um, explicit choices uh, is really quite different. You see the bias has gone like that. I mean, it's just like a steady decline. But over that same period of time, and one group has actually done decadal studies of both explicit and implicit bias, and every time they do it, they find that the implicit bias, this is unintended bias, but the kind that we're seeing in the evaluation of these, um, the credentials of these applicants has stayed exactly the same. So you keep doing this experiment, you give people the credentials, different name, and you still get the advantage to men uh, over women after 40 years. So that's kind of interesting because what we say and what we think about, hopefully we would all agree, has changed a lot since um, the mid 20th century. And yet the biases shown in experiments like this don't, um, don't change. So how do we live with ourselves? A number of groups have looked at that and said, you know, how do we uh, believe that we're fair, we wanna be fair, we think we live in a meritocracy, 
And yet we do this consistently. Whenever somebody tries to measure it, uh, we, we seem to prefer one group over another, even though they have the same credentials. And one group that actually was at Yale uh, but left before I got there did a really interesting study where they not only asked who would you hire, but then they asked why would you hire the person. And they f they, what they did was they varied the credentials so that either the man or the woman w had much more education or much more experience. And what they found is that people would explain their choice by whatever the characteristic was that the man had. So if in their package the man had more experience, they would say, oh, well, you have to have more experience to do this job. So that's why I picked this guy. And then if you needed, if, if the woman had that characteristic, then they'd say, oh, you need more education. You've got to be educated for this job. That's why I picked this guy. So this is something that we seem very able to do, that we find the differences in these evaluate, the, the packages that we're evaluating, whatever they may be, and, and it turns out it goes right to scientific papers. And there's enough subjectivity in any of these reviews, because we're looking at people and no two people are the same, that you can pick on characteristics other than race or gender to explain your biased um, uh, result. So that's kind of devastating, but it's also very heartening because they went back and they did a study where they asked people to write out the criteria they were using to evaluate the candidates before they did the evaluation. And they found that the bias went not completely away, but mostly away. So that, that's pretty heartening that maybe we can trick our brains not to rely on these prejudices if we're not just saying, I, I know it when I see it or take a gut level reaction, but we're actually doing a more analytical um, uh, analysis of our reviewing process. So the last group of experiments are the real life studies, and those are uh, very hard to do. They're not in controlled conditions, but you want to use individual variables um, to test impacts and causality, and so that's really tough. But there have been some that have been done that are quite uh, stunning in this field. And one that was done uh, by a professor who actually used her own credentials at the time she was hired and at the time she got tenure uh, to ask whether if she had been a man, would she be evaluated differently? So she used her credentials and took off uh, uh, or changed identifying uh, information and then sent out this package to 238 uh, clinical or uh, academic psychologists and asked the ones that were looking at the CV at the time of application, would you hire this person? And half of them got the, a male name and half got a female name on it. And then the other half of the, um, the participants, these are real academic psychologists, um, got the CV of when uh, the person was up for tenure. And again, had either a male or a female name on it. And the result on the hiring was the same as every other hiring study I've told you about. I don't need to bore you with the details. They were much more likely to hire this same package uh, if it was attributed to a man. The good news was that at tenure time, there was no effect, no statistically detectable effect on whether they would give tenure uh, based on, uh, on gender. You know, gender had no effect. That's very exciting. That's consistent with another body of work that says that the more information we have, and this may be consistent with that writing out of criteria, that is actually giving us more information because it's more detail. The more information we have, the less we rely on our biases and prejudices. And that kind of makes logical sense, right? That we're filling in gaps with our biases. If there are fewer gaps, then we're gonna go with the facts. So at tenure time, there's obviously a lot more evidence. You're hiring on what somebody has accomplished much more than on potential. And so there, that's where it starts to equalize. So they were pretty excited when they found this that you know, maybe when you have that much evidence, there's no bias. But this woman actually had, had a very strolling career. She went up for tenure early. She had more grants than anyone in her department. She had published more papers than anyone in her department over that period of time. So she asked for the CVs that she had sent to these reviewers back. And she actually was not anticipating this, but she noticed when she got them back that they had little notes on them. 
So she started calculating the frequency, and she found that these very typical cautionary comments, as she called them, were written in the margins of the tenure packages four times more often for the woman than for the man. So same tenure package, but they're writing these little reservations. And those um, came, up, uh, came off as things like this. You know, obviously, they voted for her, but they'd <coughs> say things like, yeah, we, we would need to see her job talk. Or it's impossible to make a judgment without uh, her teaching evaluations. I don't know a whole lot of academic departments that decide tenure on teaching, but um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's another story. And then the final one, which I have heard in so many faculty meetings that I can't tell you how when a, a lot of women read this, they, they just celebrated because it was finally demonstrated that this is said so often in closed faculty meetings, oh, I don't believe she did that on her own. Or how do we know that the other author, whoever the author might be, didn't do all the work? And here it was, they wrote it right on these CVs that they knew were actually going to be looked at by somebody because they had to send them back. So that's how unconscious it is, that people aren't, aren't concerned about sharing their concerns because they think, oh, if this had been a man, of course I would have applied the same concern. I sure would have been worried that he had gotten those grants uh, on his own or published those papers on his, on his own. And I will attest, after going to hundreds of more faculty meetings about uh, hiring candidates and giving tenure than I care to think about how many times I've heard this said about women, and I can testify I've never heard that said about a male uh, candidate. So in every study that we've looked at, just to summarize, there is a statistically significant effect, and then of course the hundreds of others, of the gender or in the case where they looked at race or the race of the person being evaluated. But in none of these is the race or gender of the person who's doing the evaluation a, a factor. It doesn't come out significant in any of these studies. So that says that we all carry these biases and we probably equally don't intend them. Maybe women uh, are more passionate about not discriminating uh, against other women than men are. We don't know that. But we know that whatever people say consciously, they still do the same thing. So that's a pretty important statistic for thinking about how we address um, these, uh, these problems. So the summary is, as I said before, that conscious bias or explicit bias, racism, sexism, as uh, social scientists measure it, has decreased measurably over 30 or 40 years. And the unconscious biases, the implicit biases, have not um, changed. So I find this a pretty com compelling body of evidence. We have first these sort of population level indicators of salary or um, of getting uh, uh, fellowships uh, and many other things that have been looked at or, or salaries uh, or um, like popu the, the entire population salary one I find particularly uh, compelling. But you can always say that there could be other variables. But that shows that whatever this is, is happening at a large population level. This is not just a little group um, that is discriminating. And then the model systems show us that in a really clean system, we can isolate the variable so nothing else varies except the gender or the race. And we can clearly demonstrate causality that if the person is a woman or a, a minority, they will be rated lower, get a lower salary, and hired less. And then there are the real life studies where, like this last one with the tenure case, they went out into a real population of professors in the field and uh, had them do the, the rating, and the same result was observed with some interesting twists. So I talked for about 10 years, more than that, probably 15 years about this work uh, with various universities and uh, leaders of universities and faculty, what I would always hear, particularly from the male faculty, um, and that's, I have not counted that, but I, I have an impression of that. I know it when I see it again. For, um, <laughs> but there is a sense that it was male faculty, but it doesn't matter who said it because it was pretty consistent. And it was this dismissiveness. They would try to come up with reasons why they didn't believe the data. So one that, that I always just loved is women and minorities are too sensitive. Huh? 
I mean, I can never figure out what that was about. What does that have to do with this, right? We're, we're sensitive that we're not being paid as much or we're not being hired even though we have the same credentials, but I heard it repeatedly. Then they would say, it's not like that at my place. And so when I uh, showed the, in the early days of, of uh, showing the data, I would show the, the Swedish postdoc study because uh, it was one of the few things done in science. Um, and so then they would say, oh, but that's in Sweden. In America, we don't do that. <laughs> and I, I kid you not, these are, these are absolute truth quotes. Then I gave a talk um, at an HHMI meeting, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and with two postdocs. And at lunch, they were all coming up with hypotheses about why this was, was the case. And uh, this one character decided it had to be the Midwest, because I was at the University of Wisconsin at the time. I said, I didn't do these studies. They're not in the Midwest. They're all over. No, no, no. I know it's the Midwest. Then I gave a talk. Larry Summers, the uh, then president of Harvard, asked me to come and work with his deans. And so I met with the deans and I talked about some of this evidence. And one of them literally said, oh, I'm sure they do that at, well, for example, Yale, but Harvard doesn't do that. <laughs> so then a few years later, I went to Yale and I became a faculty member there. And the provost asked me if I would do some diversity training for department chairs. And so I actually, one of the great uh, discoverers of this field, one of the people who invented actually the, the word implicit bias, is a professor at Yale. So we did it together. And I thought, well, that's great. You know, I have all the credibility in the world because I've got the guy who actually does this work and teaches statistics next to me. So they're going to believe it. Don't you know it? <laughs> they said that happens at Harvard. You know, we've always been better than Harvard, and that's one of the ways they do that at Harvard. We don't do that here. So I went back to my then lab, and I, I had a social psychologist in the lab at the time, and I was just sort of ranting at her, and I was saying, what am I going to do? They, you know, no matter what experiment you do, they, they say that it can't possibly apply to them. And of course, the ultimate one, oh, oh yeah, th this is another one. The chemists would always say it was the economics department. I have no idea why, but economists <laughs> have a really bad reputation. Sorry if they're any economists. And, and, then, and then another thing they would do is they would, they would hone in on, on some uh, number or value in one of the studies and not look at the entire body of evidence that I would presented. They would just want to argue about whether the standard deviation was actually significant in a particular study. So that, that's another way they would get away from it. But the biggest one that I couldn't deal with was we're scientists. And I had done this training just for science chairs. And I couldn't say, no, scientists do this too. It's possible that scientists are trained to be objective and somehow do less of this. And there are a few studies, but not perfect ones, that would suggest otherwise. But I was, when I was ranting to my postdoc, we sort of just both looked at each other at the same time, and I think we had the same thought. There's only one thing we can do here, and that's to do the experiment. So we did, and the uh, study was, a, of 127 biologists, chemists, and physicists. We picked six top research universities, three public and three private for a little variety. They were geographically dis distributed across the country. And we sent them a description of a student uh, and asked them, would you hire this student? A series of questions. This was uh, a stu student that was like a senior in college applying for a lab manager position. And then we asked them, do you think that the person is competent? Would you hire them? Would you give them mentoring? What would you pay them? And the only difference, we used one application. Absolutely, everybody got the same one. And it either had Jennifer at the top or it had John at the top. That was the only difference. And those names have previously actually been vetted to show that they have evoked very similar reactions to people. So, so there have been panels that have looked at re responses to names. So those are very comparable names. And so. First, uh, the hiring came out just like all the others. Uh, in fact, they were substantially more likely uh, on a five-point scale, you can see here, uh, about uh, more than 1.0, uh, likely to uh, hire John versus Jennifer. And it was highly statistically significant. In fact, this part of it became statistically significant um, when we had 26 respondents, which for anyone who's ever done human research, 
is a uh, very, very unlikely, uh, unlikely result unless the characteristic that you're measuring is very broadly distributed across your population. And so I think we have really good evidence from the statistics that this is not just a few outliers. This, this is uh, very commonly held. And then they asked, uh, would you give this student mentoring? And for some reason, I had my own prejudices, I guess. I thought this one was going to come out um, the opposite, that they would be more likely to mentor the woman. Um, and no, they would give the man, uh, be more likely to give the man uh, more mentoring. And that was different by uh, about 0.6 points. And then the salary, and don't get too upset yet. I mean, it's upsetting, but note that it's a partial scale here, OK? It doesn't go down to zero. <laughs> Um, but it's still a pretty substantial salary difference. They would pay uh, the man about uh, close to 15% more than uh, the woman. So just take a second and think about that. You know, that's the same student, the same application, the same credentials, and simply calling that person Jennifer or John changes the salary, their assessment of the competence, whether they'd hire and whether they would mentor. So, this then became uh, a fairly, and, and, oh, and, and the last part is the same as every other experiment. If you look at the gender of the, the participants who were doing the rating, there was no difference. So with the, the, when they were judging the male, um, the blue is women and the pink is men. You can see they're identical uh, as raters. And then with the female, there's a slightly, um, uh, a slight difference that's not statistically significant uh, of male and female raters of the woman student. So again, men and women do it. Uh, no evidence that it's different across universities, across departments, which is interesting because if you look around, biology departments have a lot more females usually on the faculty than um, physics departments, for example. Uh, no effect of geography uh, in the country. No effect in our experiment of whether it was a public or a private, small sample there, I wouldn't uh, conclude too much. Uh, and most importantly, no effect of whether it was a woman or a man. There was also no, a lot of people have asked, is there an effect of age? And we didn't ask age, but we did ask rank. So we had assistant professors, associate, and, and full professors, and there was no difference among those three groups. So some more recent studies have followed up on this and done some similar uh, structure, ex experiments that are structured similar, similarly but ask different questions. And one that I thought was really interesting was done um, at Penn looking at whether uh, faculty would answer emails from uh, students with different kinds of names. And they found that the response to women and ethnic minorities, the same email, was much, much lower uh, than uh, the, the white men. And there are some interesting, it's, it's a paper worth looking at. It's, it's, uh, there are some interesting differences among different eth ethnicities. Um, I believe that it was the Asian women that were the least often responded to. I have no idea what that bias is, but that's, um, that was the result. <coughs> Um, so the other thing that was found in that study was that there is a difference between publics and privates. And at least in their sample, and we don't know which universities they were looking at, they found a greater bias uh, at the private institutions. And then there, was, um, oops, sorry. then there was another study that I found particularly disturbing that looked at the assistant professors in the biomedical sciences and found that they come from a very small percentage of the labs that do biomedical research. And when they looked, they found that, in fact, uh, more than half of them came from labs that they called the elite labs. And these were labs defined as either uh, run by Howard Hughes Medical Investigators, which is one uh, honor in science, uh, that were Nobel Prize winners uh, at the head or members of the National Academy of Sciences. So they, they just arbitrarily called those the elite labs. They found that these are 5% of the labs in their sample, and more than half of the assistant professors came from those labs. So that in itself, you know, kind of leaves you thinking maybe we're narrowing our, our base of faculty from uh, this group unnecessarily. But what's really disturbing is that in the women's labs of the elite labs, there were equal men and women. 
In the elite labs run by men, there were many, many more men than women. And of course, there are more men running these elite labs just because of, of numbers. So there's a real sieve there that if you have to go through an elite lab to have uh, a very good chance of getting an assistant professor job, and you're not a man, so you're mes less likely to be in one of those labs, for whatever reason, we don't know whose choice that was, that, that presents a real bottleneck for um, women scientists. So then the question arises, all right, what do we do? Um, and that's, I think, the open question and what I'm struggling with as uh, a policymaker. What can we do to help institutions and individuals apply criteria that they want to apply, the ones they intend to apply, rather than these biased things based on people's uh, gender and race. So uh, one example that has been done in nice randomized controlled studies is a board game called Wages, which um, has, <clears throat> it's like a monopoly game. It has people play as either males or females, and they get different advantages and disadvantages. And it really builds a great sensitivity to um, what happens, these little differences along the way and how they end up with really big wins or losses. Um, one of the things I'm trying to work with a couple of the journals on is to do blind reviews. So there are, there are a couple of journals that have done this and they found uh, in both cases uh, that when they went to blind reviews, which means the paper, uh, the author of the paper was unknown to the reviewer, they just took the front page off, um, the proportion of papers that they published by women went way up, and one of them was by a third. So, and that was just on a six-month period, um, two, two very similar journals, or two very different journals that had similar results. So I think that especially for journals like Nature and Science uh, and some of the other so-called elite journals have this process where they have the first-tier review by a bunch of editors at the journal. And they usually read the abstract and very quickly may scan the paper and make a very quick judgment. And sometimes these, these editors are getting hundreds of papers a day, so they have to do it quickly. So that's a case where we're giving them less information. And remember the evidence that the more information people have, the less they rely on their biases. So I think we're just inviting bias with that process. And it would be interesting to look if the journals would give us their data uh, at whether there's uh, a greater um, discrimination or apparent discrimination at that level versus at the more in-depth review level where the papers that are actually reviewed um, are looked at in quite some detail. So that's, that's one experiment we could do and um, American Association for the Advancement of Science just has a new director and or president and we're hoping that maybe some changes will happen there. Um, another element that we're working on is training. And there's some evidence that if you train people in bias in certain ways, and not every way works, you can reduce the impact uh, of bias in their decision making. And so we're hoping that we can tie this to grant making in the sciences, for example, and train um, panels that are making decisions uh, in bias and encourage them to think really carefully about their decisions and hold themselves accountable um, for being fair and unbiased. And there's a little evidence that this works. Uh, we also uh, are hoping that we can get that embedded in graduate training and maybe even faculty training. And then there's a really interesting field of work uh, called um, image priming or visual priming. And that shows that when people see certain images, their behavior changes. And so if you show them pictures of the kind of, for example, woman that you might want to hire for a science position or an African-American, a positive image of an African-American, they will rate the uh, applications that they read after that differently. Now, unfortunately, that effect only lasts for 24 hours. So you kind of have to keep priming people with it. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we want to do um, to address that. Um, so I've been trying to advocate, when, when I was at Yale, I was trying to advocate um, for artistic interventions. Um, it's a very art artistic campus, and I argued that the white walls that uh, are just painted solid white in many of the classrooms could be covered with murals that would have the kind of diversity of scientists that we'd like to see, not that we have. And so and in White House policy, we're hoping that we can have an effect on the way we teach science, and I haven't had time to talk about that today, but there are 
differences in the way women and minorities respond to certain kinds of teaching, so we're hoping to have an effect there. And then address bias through a series of these interventions that require people to just think about their biases. And then one of the efforts that I'm really excited about is working with the media. There's a long history in this country of the entertainment media, particularly television, changing social behaviors by embedding things in the television shows, and especially if they do this at prime time. And so this goes back to the 1950s, there's evidence. Uh, and now actually a number of activist groups use that. So there's like one against teen pregnancy, uh, that, that tries to manage teen pregnancy that went to um, television and said, okay, you've got to get this issue into your shows. And so they started writing it into the shows and had interesting conversations between mothers and daughters about pregnancy. And there actually is some evidence that it had an effect on uh, rates of pregnancy. So we'd like to do the same, getting better and more diverse images of scientists generally. It's not just a gender thing. I think scientists are portrayed in a very um, depressing way that if you're a 12-year-old girl, you'd never really want to be like one of those people uh, for the most part. And so it's showing scientists just more generally as interesting people and, and uh, normal people, because some of them really are, uh, but also <laughs> showing a better gender and, and racial and ethnic uh, mix. And that would be so easy to do. Um, one of the things that was pointed out to me when I got to the White House is, have you heard of the show West Wing? I hope you guys aren't too young for that. Okay. Um, the one position of the president's uh, advisory staff that was not shown was the science advisor. So I want to suggest to uh, Chandra Grimes, who I think is a really brilliant uh, social activist writer, yeah, a few fans <laughs> of Chandra Rhimes here, <laughs> who has put all sorts of social issues into her shows. I want her to write a show about the um, uh, president science advisor, we could give her lots of material, and that science advisor would just happen to be a black woman. So we'll see if we can get that done. So those, that's the way that some of the research that, uh, we're, that I, my group is very interested in at the White House is being reduced to policy. And I'm happy to talk about with people about that more, but I think you've been sitting a long time, so with that, I'll close. Thank you. Um, so a lot of organizations have, I guess, kind of affirmative action policies or they try to purposely make sure their hiring pools are diverse um, in certain ways. So they look at resumes and kind of look for keywords that would imply that someone is a, is a woman or a minority and try to ha has, have those in their applicant pools. Have you guys found any evidence or has been any studies to show if that works better or worse than just having it be a blind review where there's no identifying information and all you have is actually the, the statistics or the, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good question. If they're not even in the pool, then you can't really be biased against them. So it seems like both are necessary. Um, th I think your word about mentioning the pool is the important thing because it's not legal to favor women for a job where there's no obvious reason that a, you know, a woman could do that job only. Um, and so, I mean, that, that's just, just not what the Supreme Court has supported. But there's nothing preventing us from gathering women and minorities to our pool. And that really is an important thing because the National Science Foundation did a very small experiment one year where they asked people to write down the top 100 people in their field. And, oh no, they did just top 10, top 10 people in the field. And they had very, very few women on the list. And then they asked the same people, or people from the same fields, other people, to look at a list of 100 people, mixed men and women, and pick the top 10. When the names were in front of them, these are real people, um, they would pick many of the women. Many of the women ended up, and I think it was close to even half in some of the fields, of the top 10 would be women. So that says that when we think ecologist, or chemist, or whatever we're looking for, we just think male. And there's actually a lot of evidence to, to, to show that, that we just associate scientist and male much more readily. So if we have to uh, rely on people just coming up with names, 
which is what they often do for um, searches, particularly at the higher levels, they're not going to come up with women and minorities. You're just not going to think of them. So if you, if you ask them to enrich for those groups, then you at least have a shot at it because if the good people are in the pools, you know, they should rise to the top no matter what, we hope. Um, if they're you know, doing a fair search. So it's the first step. You, you know, if you don't get them in the pool, then those people aren't going to get jobs. And so I, I think they're both really important. I have not seen a comparison of which is more important. Another question. Um, um, you said on one of your previous slides, right near the end, that women and uh, minorities respond differently to different teaching approaches. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that, please? Yeah, there's a large field of study of what's called active learning, which is any kind of learning experience where students have to engage with material and solve a problem or answer an in-depth question. So that's just active learning. And it can be, it can be research, it can be uh, writing a question on a note card. I mean, there are many, many types of active learning. But as a field, um, there is no question, and there was a, a meta-analysis recently of 250 papers in this area, there's no question that people learn better by active means than when they're just lectured to. So you didn't learn anything in the last hour, by the way. Um, and there are ways to overcome that, but most of our introductory science courses don't. So we're teaching people by the worst method we know of in the learning literature to learn science. And as I said, the, I mean, one of the things that's so impressive about American University is you do a lot less of that. But at most, most undergraduates are learning their introductory science in these big lectures. And in the experiments where there's been a change made and they move to an active system, grades go up, attendance goes up, also their, their interest in science goes up, their uh, interest in being a major in that area, go, it, it's just incredible. But the difference between it's good for men and white men, but the difference between men and women and minorities and majority students is quite striking. That it's better for men, but not as much better as it is for women and minorities. So it actually is one of the few ways we know of to level the playing field, because you're not giving anyone an advantage in this case. If we keep lecturing, there's actually an advantage Men are learning by a method that apparently agrees with their either social structures or uh, mental or something else better than it agrees with women, and there's some evidence for minorities as well. So we could benefit the entire population by moving to active learning, but we could also level the playing field and make it easier for, men, for women and minorities to succeed simply by engaging our students' minds, which really doesn't sound like such, such a terrible thing to do. <laughs> Um, so about 10 years ago, I read a book called Women Don't Ask. I don't know if you've heard of this book, but it changed my life. And one central thesis of it was that um, when women are offered a job and a, and a salary, they, f they much less frequently counter yeah. um, than men, mm -hmm. especially at that very first job in out of college. So my question for you is, do you think, and, and ever since I read it, I always ask for more. Um, <laughs> and I get it a lot of times, which is nice. So my question for you is, do you think that in that, that experiment that you did about sending Jennifer or John and asking for a salary, which had such a big difference in it, do you think if women were more comfortable asking for more that it would level the financial playing field and sort of seep into other areas of this whole issue? That, that's actually a double-edged sword. So there, a more recent book than that one is Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, which kind of says the same thing, that women have to just push harder and be more persistent. And I have a real problem with those books because it, it and, and to her credit, Sandberg mentions this in her book, but she doesn't really explain why she thinks it won't apply. And that is that there's a body of evidence that shows that women engaging in the same behaviors as men don't get the same result. And one of the penalties, as the social psychologists call it, is for women being too aggressive, seen as too assertive, too demanding. Um, there are all sorts of uh, lines of evidence that show that uh, women are seen as harsh if they, they do exactly the same things. 
And similarly, there's an experiment that uh, actually one of my postdocs, the one who ran the Yale study, uh, did as, as a graduate student where she inserted modest language into men's interviews and that actually decreased their, um, their higher ability. So just like one line here and there, just you know, being modest. So women are supposed to be modest, men are supposed to be braggarts. If you don't live I in the lines with the stereotype, there's a reaction. It doesn't mean you know, you're gonna fail at it. There will be people who uh, succeed at asking and I think it's always better to ask than not. Um, but there is that potential for a penalty. We have um, two moderators today that I wanna introduce you to. Lena Weinman and Jesse Hertenstein. Um, they are going to guide us through this progress process today, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Great. Okay, I guess I can. Hi, my name is Lena Weinman, and I'm one of your moderators for today's panel. Um, so I am a senior at AU. I'm studying public health and a biology minor, and I'm hoping to pursue a career in medicine. Uh, so hi, I'm Jesse. I'm your other moderator today. Um, right now I'm a senior at American. I'm double majoring in physics and math. And in the fall, I'll be starting a PhD program at UC Davis for physics. So that's exciting. Um, but we've actually invited you guys here today because um, Dr. Joe Handelsman is visiting us. And what's becoming clear, partly because of the work that Dr. Handelsman has done, is that mentorship has helped increase the participation and success of women who have wanted to pursue careers in science. Mentorship is an important part of how all of us become successful scientists, whether we are part of groups that are historically underrepresented in science or not. So the format for today's event is, as you can see, going to be a panel. Um, we will let our panelists introduce themselves and we'll start off with some pre-planned questions and then we will open the, um, the room up to questions from the audience. Um, and so we are asking that our panelists keep their responses somewhat brief. Um, but we're excited to hear from all of them. And then we also have Pragati live tweeting um, with the hashtag AU Science Mentors, which was mentioned earlier. And then also Dr. Meg Bentley um, fielding questions from the audience and from the Twitterverse as well. <laughs> um, so you can ask your questions via Twitter. You can um, tweet them um, right now live. And then you can also put questions in the jar or you can feel free to raise your hand and we can pass the mic around. Um, so today for our panelists, um, we are really hoping to help us explore what it means to find and to be a good mentor. Um, Dr. Joe Handelsman is our special guest today. We're very gracious that she has joined us. Um, and then we also have three professors from AU, Dr. Katie DeSico Skinner, Dr. Nate Harshman, and Dr. Matt Hardings. Um, so panelists, please briefly introduce yourself and then we'll turn it over for questions. Uh, hi, I'm Matt Hardings. Um, I'm in the Department of Chemistry and, and I, you know, aside from seeing the, knowing the importance of, of this topic, I personally, I, I have uh, two little girls, eight and six, who are science fanatics. And, and so uh, there's a more personal level for me to, to make sure that we see women succeed in, succeed in science and are enabled to do science and work in this field. I am Katie DeSica Skinner. I am an associate professor in the biology department. And um, I'm also a mother, so I also have an eight and a seven year old. And uh, in addition to that, my laboratory currently has nine members, uh, six of whom are female and three are males. Hi, Nate Harshman. I'm chair of the Department of Physics and associate professor. I've been here at AU for 12 years and I've watched the science programs grow and I think that one of the ways we've grown is by trying to be inclusive and by trying to address diversity issues uh, directly. Great, so um, now that we've met everyone, we wanna get the panel started. Uh, we'd like to ask our guest, Dr. Handelsman, and a member of our AU community, Dr. Hardings, to define for us what they believe a good mentor is for women in science. And also, what do you do for students on a daily basis or at important times in their career? <laughs> Somebody else. Uh, so, uh, as a mentor, um, I, I think my biggest responsibility and, and the most important job that I have is to listen. Uh, to listen to, to all the students who come That through. was my answer. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, 
No, it, I, I mean, really, it, it's to listen to the people coming through my lab and working with me and understanding not only what interests them, what science interests them, but understanding who they are as people and what they want to do with their lives. In conjunction with that, I'm, I'm sitting up here in my privileged white maleiness. <laughs> and, and so... You disgust me. Oh, <laughs> you know. um, it, it's also my responsibility to ask and listen to my colleagues and peers at other institutions. And I have some really good friends at, who are faculty members at other universities. And, and I also, we're, on, you know, we're doing this Twitter town hall right now. I, I have a lot of good contacts on Twitter who are just phenomenal voices and for women in science. And, and it's a great place to hear a whole diversity and a whole range of, of voices. Uh, Kate Clancy, Danielle Lee, Karen <coughs> James, among, among others who are, who are active uh, on Twitter, both in talking about their science, but also talking about uh, women and minority issues for access to science. And, and so listening externally so that I can better understand how to uh, mentor the people who work with me is also a very important thing to do. I think listening is the top priority. I totally agree. Uh, I think people are uh, not listened to very often and mentors, this is the negative side, mentors often give advice that they think the mentee wants or needs, not what the mentee is really looking for. But the um, flip side of that is that sometimes our mentees don't have the confidence to believe that they can do what we think they can do. And so I, I think it's always important not to take the mentee's word for it um, that what they really want is something here when you know that their talents could take them much higher. And so sometimes it's a matter of painting pictures for them and describing what you imagine for their future and see what lights them up. And if they say, oh, I, I'm not good enough for that, that's one thing, y you ignore it. If they say, ooh, that sounds like a terrible life, okay, then, then you can drop it. But if they just say, I'm not good enough for that, which is often what you hear from uh, in, in less than competent uh, young people, you can fight that. And especially in a long mentoring relationship, you can work toward that level of confidence and find out what reinforces them. Um, and unfortunately, that lack of confidence is more often associated with women and minorities because they've been given so much less reinforcement from day one uh, to be scientists. And, uh, and I think it's really important that we begin to counter that at the college level. Great. Um, and also, as a follow-up for Dr. Hirschman and Dr. DeSico, um, what do you two do as a mentor here at AU to be a good mentor? Um, well, hopefully I'm a good mentor. I try. <laughs> I think I'm constantly changing my mentoring ability to try to reflect what I think would be good or, you know, for the students. Um, I think going along with both of the comments, you know, earlier, kind of knowing your students and listening are key. And one of the things I've really noticed is that you cannot paint all students with the same brush. So I can't instantly say if I have a female entering my laboratory, I need to give her X, Y, and Z. Because one of the things I've noticed is that I have people that enter my lab that are extremely confident in their scientific prowess because they've already done science before. I have people that come in that are incredibly insecure because they've never done science and they're not confident. And I think kind of learning what the strengths are of everybody coming into your lab and then um, learning where the weaknesses are so you know directly what to improve upon. You can take some of the shyest students and know that you're gonna work with them a little bit harder uh, if they have to get up and give a seminar or give a talk or you can take other students and there's something else you need to work on. So I think it's really getting to know the student and kind of learning, I guess I should say tailoring your, mentor, your um, mentoring ability to the needs of the student. Uh, so I think, uh, so one thing that maybe hasn't been mentioned yet about mentors that I try to do is uh, the networking part, whether I'm talking about just being connecting people to things that are happening on campus or just knowing what the resources are. I mean, that's definitely something that a mentor can do. And, and right, and, and sort of the, the dark side of mentoring can be that often there's mentoring taking place. I mean, I, I'll say my least favorite 
phrase in the mentoring universe is, he's a good guy. Do you, I, I don't know how often you all have heard that phrase right. That is a phrase that only is used by men for men, right? But it is used across the sciences as a code, uh, maybe even across academia, as he's a good guy, right? And so, so there is a good guy network that exists, right? And, and that is partially what reifies inequalities. And so partially what a good mentor can do is, first off, be aware that that network exists and try to tap everyone into that network. On my worst days, I try to tear that network down, but that doesn't help anyone, right? <laughs> but, but the, right, so first off, there is that network and try to make sure that everyone's plugged into that. The other thing is, is we also, when we're talking about mentoring, there's different kinds of mentoring. For example, I have students that I mentor in research, and that's a very different relationship. But I also have a lot of students who I mentor more just career mentoring, and those are different skill sets. And to be honest, most of us haven't certainly received any training in what are evidence-based or research-based practices in these kinds of things. So it is definitely a learning process. And I think you've just got to always be self-critical uh, in, in how you're doing it and making sure that you're sort of correcting course as along because you can um, learn about how to do these things better. And so you've, uh, to be a good mentor, you should be changing what you're doing and learning new practices. Hey, thank you. So I guess we'll go ahead and open it up to the floor if anyone has any um, initial questions. A uh, question for Dr. Harshman. Is it the good part or the guy part that you object to? <laughs> so it, it's literally just that that comment is only ever said by men for men, right? I mean, you can't, I've never heard somebody say, she's a great gal, right? <laughs> it just, it just. So that's a different thing. That's absolutely right. I mean, obviously, uh, gendered pronouns are used for a reason. They, they, you know, we have to we clarify language with gendered pronouns. It's really the the concept of a good guy, which is is there's a person who, oh yeah, you can trust him. He's part of the, of the network. He's part of the network. I mean, maybe I'm sounding like some sort of paranoid person here, <laughs> but but this is, uh, I've been around academia long enough that to me this is an immediate code for uh, someone who believes in the meritocracy and believes that the meritocracy is functioning well already and that by coding someone as a good guy, they are someone who is conforming to the myth of the scientific meritocracy. I know I'm sounding a little paranoid and political, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what the code means to me. And again, I was raised in the 90s, so I was raised with political correctness, and I sort of write, and so I believe in the power of language, and to me, good guy. guy. I, well, I, I was intellectually, I, I was born in the late 90s. No, uh, uh, no I, mean, so I mean, but like, so I believe in the power of language. So what is the opposite of a good guy? Um, is it a bad girl? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, what is the opposite of a good guy? What, what is the kind of phrase we would want to use to be like, this is a person who is actually someone who you want in your network and who will be a good node in a mentorship network? Okay, let me start off by saying, I think this morning I was talking to a colleague walking from this building, and I was referencing somebody in my department who's male, and I said, he's such a good guy. So now yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah, maybe yeah, I should, no, no, all right. I, should, <laughs> I shouldn't be saying this, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you're right, and so I, I don't mean to be language police. Uh, uh, I, I guess I just want people to be careful when they use language, mm -hmm. that they're using language that you could apply more generally. I mean, uh, I think, I mean, do you got a good one? I, I, I can do language police for a minute here. Good. So um, earlier this week, um, I, I tweeted out an article with the, the hashtag on, the, there was someone who did a study of um, letters of recommendation uh, coming from, from faculty members all across the country. And so they. They, they studied the, re the letters of recommendation and there are specific words that are used to describe women and specific words that are used to describe men. And, and that is something that, that we need to be cognizant of and, and not do as, as we're sending out recommendation letters. And some of them were, were, were seemingly nefarious, right? Like hard working was the con was a, turned out to be very coded for female. Right, you say that that women are hardworking because you're sort of implying that the the I mean I guess the the co the conjugate of that is the men are so brilliant they don't have to work hard, well, right? And brilliant and, and some, brilliant of the words, was, some of the words was, that were on the, the male on side. On the male side, right? Talk, so yeah. so I think again these studies show us that language have power. Mm -hmm. Great. We can open it up. 
Um, in training women, young women, I train graduate students, one of the issues I see over and over again is confidence. And I think this is really, women have to own their accomplishments and have more self-confidence. But the social psychology studies tell us that women should not fake confidence. So how do you coach women to be more comfortable with their accomplishments? How do you teach them to be more confident you know, at the, in the, at the undergraduate and graduate student level so that they will um, you know, put themselves out there for the opportunities and write that paper and send it to science. And, you know, well, everything I, depends on confidence. I think a lot of that has to do with a lot of women, I think, and probably more so than males, although I don't have the studies to back it up, but have sort of an inherent insecurity. And so I think positive reinforcement and some of the things like, um, again, I've had women, plenty of women that have moved through my lab. I mean, last year we had 14 people in the lab. And confidence builds as their techniques build. So it's not even like it's me per se doing anything for them, but it was just they naturally, I think, with a lot of positive reinforcement, and which, by the way, this isn't a male, I'm giving it to the males as well, you know, but, um, but you just kind of see confidence builds over time. But I think you're right that um, I remember, you know, even being seven and having my mom, who was a very, very strong woman saying, you know, you have to be your own advocate. And I think um, that that's a message that we have to send out there is a lot of women are not their own advocate. And I think that that is a problem. Okay, do we have any other questions from the audience? I, I was gonna just oh, add oh, one sorry. thing to that, that you, you might, and as a specific thing, right, is that when you're being your own advocate, it is communication, right? Mm -hmm. So one particular skill that often as scientists, we don't actually give uh, instruction in, again, or as much as we could, is oral communication, written communication, and these kinds of things. And so, uh, not that we want to fake confidence, but really practice in saying things quickly and clearly, uh, is, is, and giving people the confidence that they can explain themselves uh, effectively is at least part of the solution. It's a practical small step. And so, making people go up to the board to talk about underwater acoustics, for example. Sorry, that was pointed. Okay. Um, so I have a question, uh, I guess, back on mentoring, but more about high school. And I know you guys are all college professors, so high school is a little bit different. Um, but you also don't get the same mentoring you do in college and high school. And high school is one of the main times where people are choosing careers and choosing what they want to study um, in college. And I know you mentioned your mom when you're seven. So I guess, what do you think people could do younger, even, so that people want to go into science careers in college? Do you want to go ahead and take this one? Well, I think. It's before even high school. It's, I mean, it's probably went from when people are able to think and see and talk. But we know that girls turn away from science most often in the middle school years. And I think that's been associated with, and, and I think a large uh, part of it is due to the images that they see, because that's the time when they're starting to explore their own sexuality, their identity as women. And that's the time when they're going to start having these dichotomous choices in their minds, either I'm a scientist or I'm a, an attractive woman. I can't be both. And so that's where I think the media could help us enormously by showing a diversity of women who have you know, normal lives, kids, do the things that women do, and they also just happen to be scientists. I mean, great job, but it's not like you're some freaky, geeky uh, other species. Um, and so I think that's really important for middle school, and, and there are actually some networks, television networks, starting to work on targeting uh, middle school girls. Um, in high school, I think the, the, there's a lot of study there about what we do to discourage high school students. And you know, there, there's one study that if you ask parents, uh, if you match parents by the grades that their kids are getting, and you ask them how good their, their son or daughter is in math, they will, on average, rate their daughters lower with the same grades as the males. Uh, so that's even parents, you know, who are advocates and, and on, on the same side. And then you think about teachers. They call on boys more. They give boys more reinforcement for their answers. They'll say, oh, you know, great answer, Johnny. Did everyone hear Johnny's answer? And to the girls, they say, yeah, that's right. And y they've done videotaping of teachers, and you see this over and over. 
and it's a little bit like in the study that I talked about of, uh, from, from Yale, that um, those people were less likely to mentor a girl or a woman. And if you think of all the little things that add up over a lifetime, you know, the teacher who stays after class to talk to you, they're just a little more likely to stay for a guy. If they answer your questions at a slightly more sophisticated level, if you're a guy, you can just imagine all those incremental differences by the time uh, students graduate from high school, how differently uh, they're thinking about themselves and their own skills when they even go into college, and then of course that's just being reinforced in college. So yeah, I think we need to mentor high school girls, but I think we need to show them a lot of successful women in science as well. And there, there was one study recently that said that is actually um, one of the most important um, elements is seeing or studying uh, successful women scientists. Great, thank you. So we are actually going to turn it over to Twitter now. Do we have any incoming questions? We do have one. <laughs> well, we have many, but I picked a good one. Okay, so the question is, how can you rebound if you've tried working with a mentor who's a poor fit? Not that any pick a new one. <laughs> <laughs> I would say pick a new one. I, would, um, I think you have to you know, have a mentor that is a good teacher, primarily. I think you have to have somebody who's <coughs> patient and who gets you. Um, you know, there was, I, I remember when I was getting my PhD, the professor that I chose to work with was a female and she was very high power, very high in her field. And I had actually come from a university where there were 12 male professors and no female professors at the undergrad level. So I actually really wanted to work with a female. And I worked with her and I actually didn't relate to her nearly as well as some of the other female and male professors in the department, because she actually forego, for went, um, bad English, sorry. <laughs> she chose not to have a family, um, and I knew that I didn't want that lifestyle. So I think you have to kind of pick somebody who is also gonna understand you and to have the same goals, uh, or can see you having those goals, then I think they do. Another strategy is to have more than one mentor. I mean, there's, there's usually your primary research mentor, but it's good to have your network as broad and deep mm -hmm. as possible, uh, full of people that are direct mentors, full of role models, full of, of other, just try to, try to have a nice network. And that way, those people can actually be the ones who facilitate you finding the next research mentor, for example. Mm -hmm. I think it puts too much pressure on any mentor to expect them to meet all of your needs. Mm -hmm. And it, it's unrealistic, but it also can be very uncomfortable if um, the mentee is constantly ex expecting a behavior or a contribution or you know, whatever to their life that the mentee, mentor just can't give. You know, some students want to come to their professor's houses for dinner. Well, if you've got little kids at home and you're trying to get tenure, it just may not be something you can do, but, but the guy down the hall or gal down the hall might be able to do that. So, you know, there are different types of uh, related, different ways to relate to um, students. And I think you can get that, that kind of relating from different people at the same time. Um, I always think that people need, uh, and this is especially true for faculty, but I think in graduate school uh, it, it applies as well that you need what I call the venter mentor. And that's the person that you go to to vent who doesn't have control over your future. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> especially, you know, I see this with assistant professors, they'll go to the person that they value the most as their scientific mentor, and when they don't get a grant or they get a bad teaching evaluation or somebody does something unfair, they just go in, you know, the emotional state to that person's office and just start ranting. And everyone needs to vent and everyone needs to get over whatever hurdles we have to get over uh, and as painful as they are. But we don't need to show our worst side <coughs> to the people who are actually going to judge us. And uh, I think that's just sort of a general principle. And so there are mentors that you keep just for that, who are not going to vote on your tenure or be on your, your committee uh, as a graduate student uh, that you can just vent to. Great. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hi. Um, so something I was wondering is sometimes I have I have a lot of mentors or people that I consider mentors and I will go and talk to them. Um, but sometimes I feel like perhaps I am imposing on their time too much. How do you 
uh, talk to a mentor, how would you suggest you talk to a mentor to make sure that they're finding that relationship balanced as well as you are? I think you can ask somebody, you know, is this a good time for you? Or, you know, is there, I mean, I think that's a fine conversation because there are times when, you know, you might walk into an office and somebody was just about to go out for a meeting or whatever, something. So um, I absolutely think it's, you know, you can, if not, you know, see if there's a time when, even if it's let's go grab a cup of coffee. I don't think um, having a mentor has to be a formal experience where it has to be kind of a sit down meeting where, if anything, sometimes it can make people uncomfortable. I think it could be grab a sandwich, go get coffee, do whatever, and then have a conversation at the same time. I bet it's also hard. I mean, I, that's a hard question to answer because I think it really probably depends on the person. I mean, some people are very, will be very easy to, to be open about things. Other people, it's really best to schedule with, right? I mean, there are some people who, who you will get the best mentor out of if you're formal with them, right? And then there's other ones who you'll mm -hmm. be the best if you're hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> so our, our jobs, right, are to write papers and get grants and teach classes, but our mission at any university is to see you succeed, all right? And so that's what all of us want, whether you know we're paid to do that or not. And, and so I, I, think, I think most university faculty are, are more than willing and happy to, to figure that out. But really, th there, there are a lot of personal relationship things that have to go on. You know, you feel each other out, you figure out how is it best to meet, how is it best to talk, that sort of thing. Great, and I think we had another question in the back. Hi, um, so my question was about, um, there's like a statistic that women are more likely to apologize before asking questions or before answering questions in classrooms. Um, like, for example, I do this myself. Like, I'm sorry, could you explain that again? Um, I'm sorry, this might be the answer. Uh, so my <laughs> question is, as a mentor, how do you get your female students to realize that they're entitled to help and they're allowed to be wrong? I mess up a lot. <laughs> I think my students realize that. Um, I, I don't. I don't know what what the best way to do that is, other than other than saying don't apologize. And 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 uh, so my one of my research advisors, you know, you go to a seminar with this with this man, and you know, there's someone up up there trying to give the lecture on their life's work, and you know, he interrupts fifty times during a lecture to ask questions. And it's not because he's trying to say I'm the most important person in here, but it's because he's interested and he wants to know what's going on. And I, I, I think really all of us, when, when we lecture, if people are stopping to ask questions, it's a wonderful thing. It really is. It means, it means you're listening and paying attention and not doing Facebook or whatever it is you might be doing <laughs> underneath the desk. Um, but yeah, I, it, it's a good thing. Um, but as, as, as someone who, who is lecturing or, or uh, in, in a research role, right, just saying, giving, co trying to give confidence wherever, wherever I can. And I think what you don't do in a situation like that is point out the verbal tick, uh, particularly publicly. I think, you know, people can think they're helping by saying, well, you know, why are you starting your question with an apology? But if you ask that or, or just say don't apologize, in a public venue, I think that can be really embarrassing and then people clam up and they, they become very self-conscious of their speech. Um, I think it's easier to deal with one-on-one -on -one and talk about confidence and confidence expressed in language without necessarily naming the tick, so to speak, because uh, nobody, it, nobody finds it easy to break a habit like that and if you start becoming so conscious of it that all you can hear is your apology, then you, you sort of stop talking in that setting. Do we have any questions from? We have one from the fishbowl. Great. Okay. Um, at conf this is sort of related to women. Well, it is related. Um, <laughs> at conferences, on panels, I've often seen women panelists or women in the audience interrupted while speaking or asking a question. Parentheses by a male colleague. What is the best way for? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. What is the best way for a woman to respond in such a situation? Can I tell an anecdote? Go for yeah, it. It's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> One of my colleagues at the White House is the uh, chief technology officer for the United States. 
and she uh, worked at Google for uh, quite a while. And she was on a panel recently where her previous boss from Google and she were both on it. And she was talking about bias. And she did her thing. And then she was talking, I, I forgot if she changed the subject or was still biased. And he started interrupting her. And he interrupted her many times. And finally somebody in the audience said, do you realize that you interrupted her? And apparently he didn't interrupt the uh, other male panelist uh, a number of times and he had counted. And the irony is that that's a very biased thing to do. If you, if you track uh, conversations, there is evidence that women are, are interrupted way more. But it was particularly ironic given that she was talking about bias. And then I guess he kept doing it even after it was pointed <laughs> out. Um, so I, I think it's one of those unconscious or unintended things that many people will do. Uh, interrupting and ignoring what women call the ignore my ideas phenomenon where a woman will raise an idea and the room goes silent and half an hour later a man raises the same idea and everyone says wow that's so brilliant and y you know this has been observed and measured and it, it really happens a lot and it nobody notices until you point it out and then you point it out and they they become very self-conscious about it nobody wants to do that um, but I think the interrupting is best if someone else points it out. That's my impulse is to uh, have enough of a network of people who know about these things that they can name them when they happen. Um, you know, and they can just very gently say, well, wait, I want to hear the rest of what Mary was saying. You know, it doesn't have to be a criticism or anything. It could just be I'm, I'm interested in what she's saying and hopefully they'll get the point. And then if somebody does it consistently, uh, or if you, there aren't other people around who will stand up for the woman, I think you just say it. Um, could I finish, please? And sometimes people go into a terrible sulk when you say that, and sometimes they become uh, very apologetic, and sometimes they keep talking. And so <laughs> you, you just try it and see what works in each situation. It, that's a very tough one. Thank Great. you. Um, do we have questions from the audience? I was just going to comment. I think the difference, too, is in a classroom setting, I think you assume you're going to be asked some questions, and if a student, you know, raises their hand to ask a question, you also have the opportunity, which I've definitely done at times, where I say, can, let me finish what's on this slide for a second, I'm in the middle of a train of thought, and then I'll answer your question, and then I stop and I do. So I think that's a little bit different than, you know, if you're in the middle of speaking and somebody just sort of cuts you off and, you know. I think I saw a question from the audience here. So I was really interested in what you said about, sorry, <laughs> about what you said about the seeds of these differences starting very early, and particularly because I have kids, I have girls and boys in elementary, middle, and high school, and I see them feeling like the girls, you know, and the boys, after they have science, you know, they, they can really do anything. And I'm wondering what the numbers are in terms of differences entering college, where the numbers really start to drop off? Is it, does it happen in college? Are you guilty of it? Um, does it happen in their graduate school? What are the number differences when they're going into graduate school versus going to postdoc of what you showed in your paper? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's drop off at every transition point. And so um, middle school to high school is a big one that girls who come in interested in science will ver very often, all too often, decide they're not at that stage. And if it's really truly lack of interest, that's fine, but unfortunately it's probably not always that. Um, high school is another one. They graduate high school and there's a drop off there. But really, they, the numbers of students who come into college interested in science are enormous. And this isn't a gender or a race issue. This is just, we do a really bad job in most colleges. And I would bet it's not true here because of a whole variety of things I've seen. But on average, 60% of the students who come into college intending to major in science graduate in a non-science major, 60%. So we're doing a lot more damage than the high school teachers who we all love to blame 
uh, of driving people away from science because in fact a, a lot of our undergraduates come in interested. Um, so I think that's one, uh, one more big drop off uh, point. Um, and then going to graduate school does not seem to be one of the bad ones because at least in a lot of fields that are populated by women now, the numbers are pretty equal uh, for going to graduate school. Uh, going to postdocs starts being, it's after graduate school that you start seeing a lot of differences that are claimed to be because of life choices and I think are because uh, of a lot of other things including lack of role models who have done uh, you know, combinations of things like having a life and being um, an academic scientist uh, or lack of encouragement. And again, these little you know, small points along the way where faculty can encourage their students or not. And it can, it's not a negative uh, message, it's just the lack of a message very often and that the males get stronger positive messages um, can be very disempowering to women. Uh, another thing I've seen is that women have more conflict about their careers and they may bring that conflict to a mentor and it's, it, uh, it's, it's a very fine line because on the one hand you want to you want to respect your students desires you don't want to say you know you really should be a professor because it's a much better job than what you want to do you know that that obviously is not very healthy but if they're just trying it out and they're not sure they can do it, then they may need pushing. And what I've seen is a lot of people wanting to be respectful of women's choices to have children just back off and don't give them ads for faculty jobs or whatever if the women have expressed uh, some hesitation. And so, you know, with a man, there's a much better assumption that he will go into a faculty job and, and I, they more often, I think, will get those, uh, those ads for jobs or the encouragement to apply. So I think there are messages that women send that then stimulate reactions that maybe aren't um, as positive as they should be. Okay, great. Um, I believe, do we have time for one more question? Oh, we, we can have a couple more. Oh, okay, perfect. Sorry. So we have what are um, as a woman, should I have a man or a woman as a mentor? There's research on that that shows that mentoring can be done by someone of the same uh, sex or race as well as uh, somebody who's from the opposite one. Uh, but role models have to be more uh, externally like the person who's being inspired. And I, I find that very interesting that Mentoring really is more of a skill. It's not who you are, but it's how you do it and you know what, what you uh, make of the interaction with your mentee. Whereas role models really are images and they're just helping people imagine themselves in those positions and um, they need people who look like them. Do we have any other Twitter or bigger questions? I have one last speaker question. <laughs> I like this. As a woman of color, how do I place myself in a place of success knowing that statistics are against me? <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I just think, I believe that at least at AU, and I believe that not just at AU, but there are people who are willing to have, to be good mentors, to have open discussions about gender and race and these kinds of things. I mean, I think we're moving, I think the last few years has, has actually been a place where we're talking a little bit better as a nation about this, and I think we're ready, I think, I think we're ready to look beyond statistics because of course, uh, statistics uh, can be used as a tool of inquiry, but statistics, there was a great talk last Friday by uh, O'Brien, I forget uh, what her first name was, she came and talked to the math department, talked about how statistics can be used as a tool of inequity, right? I mean, they can be a tool to reify inequity. So I think though we are in a place where um, uh, we can look past statistics and you can find people who will talk to you and listen. I think you look for a record of an institution, of a department, or of a mentor. If they've never had uh, an African-American woman graduate from their program, there might be an issue there. It doesn't mean there definitely is. It could be just the demographics or whatever. But if they haven't worked harder 
at getting more diverse students and, and mentoring them through, then, then I would worry. So I think just looking at outcomes of, uh, of people and places is very informative. I'd like to say too that this is important for everyone, but I think it's it's most important for um, for groups who are, are underrepresented. If you come in and talk to a mentor and and you define what success is for you at the very beginning, right? If you go to graduate school and you say, "I want to be a I want to be a faculty member at a research one institution." Right, you define that from the beginning, right? Something like that. If you start a new job, if you go to an, an internship, and you say, "This is my goal. This is where I want to go," I think that can be a profound thing, both to help the the mentor and to help you focus going through. Um, it, you know, for for me, it might have been easier for me to weave my path up to where I am now, but I, I think for underrepresented groups, going in and telling people who are going to write your letters for you from the beginning, this is what I want to do. I think people are very impressed by that sort of attitude, right, no matter who it comes from. But I think it might be necessary for underrepresented groups to do that. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I have one final, um, I guess, closing question to leave you guys with. Um, so we are all here. A lot of us are students. A lot of us, you know, are progressing through our careers. Um, so what do you think students and male, female, you know, um, very, you know, div di who come from different diversity, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, what do these students need to do to learn to be successful in STEM careers? I think uh, similar to the topic, I think you have to do, you do have to get a mentor because one of the things we do or we try to do, I should say, is not just um, maybe introduce you to possibilities that you weren't aware of before, whether it's job opportunities or um, what was it I was teaching this morning and I had a student ask me, I'm writing a cover letter, how long should it typically be? And, you know, and we'll offer to read letters, read cover letters, you know, edit them at times, you know, so um, I think having a mentor really help you because you can't, None of us, uh, the very first time I went to write a grant, I didn't know how to write a grant. <laughs> so actually talking to somebody who had been through the process and seeing old versions or old copies of grants to kind of give me an idea of how it is really helps. And I think it's the same for the students, like seeing people that have gone through the path and can also kind of identify challenges that you may face along the way, I think is really gonna be helpful. Great, thank you. Well, we just want to say thank you to everyone um, for the great questions and answers. Um, we are uh, coming to an end of this panel, so we want to, before we close, hear from Dr. DeSico about how AU students are already becoming great mentors, um, including the Girl Scout event that AU recently hosted. I am so proud of the Women in Science group here at AU. I really am. You guys blow me away. Like, you are so phenomenal. And just kind of quick little anecdote similar to what Dr. Handelsman was saying earlier about how things start off differently. Three weeks ago, there was a dinner conversation at my house where out of nowhere, I heard my eight-year-old daughter say, boys are better than girls are at math. Where she heard that, I don't know. All of a sudden, I just heard my husband say, uh-oh. Because <laughs> he knew how that conversation was going to go. Um, and then one week later, she was here with her brownie troop doing the Women in Science event with the Girl Scouts. And in two hours, they did physics, they did chemistry, they did biology, they did environmental science. And since that time, not only is she completely enthralled with science, but two of her classmates have come up to me in the last week saying they want to be scientists and they want to go to AU. And just seeing that track record of how much they loved it and how much you know, it meant to them, I just think it's phenomenal. So the fact that, I mean, we hope that we can be good mentors and, you know, hopefully, you know, it's a continual process for us. We're learning as we go at times and kind of, you know, tweaking our philosophies, but hopefully it teaches um, you guys how to pay it forward and starting younger and younger with the students, I think is really the way to go. Great, thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank you guys all again for coming and to remind you that this is actually just the start of the conversation. 
the hashtag um, hashtag AU Science Mentors will actually stay open, so you guys can keep tweeting your questions at that, and there will be responses coming from the Twitterverse from there as well. And we also hope to have a follow-up panel in the fall um, after science hours, um, similar to this topic, so you guys should stay tuned for that. Great, and then we also have just a closing gift for Dr. Handelsman. We just want to say again, thank you so much for being here with us. We really appreciate it, and I guess from all of us at AU, thank you so much. Oh, thank you.